Hey guys, what's up? This is Casey. This is Coach Tom. This is Shot Science Overtime number 134, I believe. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to have our live show like we have every week, and we're going to have a topic that we discuss that we think is going to help you guys become better basketball players, help you develop your game, um, and hopefully leave you in a better spot than when you got here. And uh, while we're doing that, you guys are going to send us questions. Let us know what you want to hear about in our Q&A app. Whoop. Um, and let us know what you want to hear in the Q&A app, uh, in the Q&A afterwards, and we will try to answer as many questions as we possibly can and not have any technical difficulties like that. <laughs> um, but uh, send your questions our way and tell your friends and family. Follow us on all our social media stuff. We are Shot Science on everything. We're on Facebook, Google+, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, everywhere. Subscribe to us on YouTube. <laughs> And uh, we will try to keep in touch with you guys. But right now, it's your time. Um, send us those questions. Okay. Our topic for today is make and practice missing games. And the reason I chose that, or we chose that, is because we constantly get questions from people. And even in last week's live show, people were asking, why am I making in practice? But when I get into a game, things just fall apart and nothing is working for me. So it's like a common thing that we hear all the time, right? Yes, it really is. And you know, um, the problem with it is this, is that we usually, when we're practicing our game and we're practicing by ourselves, we practice at a very casual speed. And by casual, I mean that it's not very intense uh, in what we're doing. Now, when you get into a basketball game, the intensity level rises a whole bunch when you are in a game because of just the fact that you're playing uh, uh, an opponent rather than shooting around. The fact that there's probably a crowd watching the game, you want to impress uh, uh, your teammates, the other team, people who are watching, uh, et cetera. And so what happens is that uh, as we get involved in the game, we experience some other things that we're not used to. One of them is fatigue. And, and fatigue really plays an important part about how effective we're gonna be as a basketball player. Uh, the other thing that's really important too in that whole thing is this, is that now we have a defender who is really working hard to control us, keep us from shooting, keep, it, keep us from getting to the basket, and all those elements of the game. Well, I think, okay, the, the bottom line of it all is variables that you weren't, uh, you know, inserting into exactly. the practice beforehand. Exactly. So when exactly. you step out on the floor, it's, it's, you're seeing it for the first time, yep. and you've never been in that situation. And so... You're, if you're trying to think that this kind of casual shoot around type of yeah. practice is going to suddenly uh, have a functional transition into game speed, game intensity right. uh, experience, you're, you're going to be in a, a sad place because yes. that just doesn't happen. Right. Well, and so the thing that you need to do is implement a, uh, a practice plan for yourself where you are actually executing at game speed. I mean, that's really important. And executing so that maybe you are, have an imaginary defender that you're trying to beat, an imaginary defender that you're trying to shoot over. Um, and those things are really important. In fact, you can even get somebody who can be just kind of a dummy defender who is there to kind of uh, be there so that you get used to seeing that person in front of you and having to uh, uh, do whatever it is to get by him or to get your shot off. Well, I mean, you're, you're basically just setting up the, the kind of game experience in yep. in kind of like a controlled environment right and you know we've always talked about that in terms of like the three pillars of practice and how you have to have kind of this very um kind of uh approach to the, the to your practice that's mm -hmm. going to give you the experience of really dialing in all your mechanics right. and that's what you do in the first pillar yep. and you just you spend some time with, with some purposeful slowed down practice where you're putting all the mechanics and everything together, um, you, you know, putting the footwork and everything in, and then taking that into the second pillar, which is the game speed, game intensity stuff, which right. is what you're talking about, right. where you're amping up the intensity, you are adding in a defender or you're visualizing a defender, you're going through these movement patterns at the speed that you would in a game, and you are um, really kind of getting it uh, that dialed in so that when you actually get to the third pillar, which is game experience, you have 
kind of been amped up to that speed and yeah. executing at that speed. Exactly right. Um, and getting that game experience then is going to help you when you get into uh, you know later games that maybe are more important to you or whatever your school. Yeah. But uh, you will be able to have been there before, and it's not like you're you're just going out there and you're a rookie and you've never been there. Yeah, right. Just the casualness of your practice can really be a downfall for you. It needs to be. In fact, it that's not all that practice is about. Uh, but one of the the uh, most important <clears throat> factors as you prepare to go on the floor and play at a, a game at a high level of intensity is you've got to practice that way, and that and practice that way. Uh, you know, there's an important uh, uh, thing that we talk about. I think we have a video on visualization, Casey. Yeah. And that visualization can really be important to uh, your helping you out in a game situation like that. You visualize that person in front of you. You visualize that the clock is running down and you've got to get that shot off really quick but effective. And so those are things that are really important in practicing for game speed. And this is your personal practice. This is yeah. not like something you would expect when you go and play for your team. I mean, right. your coach is going to have kind of more of a team-oriented approach to practice. This is stuff on your own time. Yep. And, you know, I don't know if a lot of people think this way, but sometimes there's people that think that the only practice they have to put in is the practice with their team and things mm -hmm. like that. But this is, this is your personal practice that you do every day and that you're consistent with. Right. Right? It is. And, you know, one of the things that, as Casey was talking there, I was kind of remembering some conversations I had earlier this week with a couple of players. And one of the things that I ask them, because it's early season, is are you guys getting very much shooting going? Well, no, coach. We haven't shot very much at all. What are you doing? Well, we're working on conditioning, and that's important as a basketball player too. And I think probably every basketball team in the country is working on their conditioning, but uh, not enough time probably spent on people shooting the basketball, and especially shooting the basketball uh, at a tense and intense level. Yeah, so I think that that's really what we wanted to address with you guys today. And uh, you know, you can go watch our video called Make and Practice Missing Games. I think right. it's named exactly the same as this yeah. live show. And we talk about the, the way to approach your practice that's exactly. going to help you so that when you get out on the floor and there's the, the, a defense and an extra, another team uh, and there's a crowd and there's, uh, you know, coaches, whatever the circumstances may be, you have kind of worked towards being able to handle all those variables. Right. Um, it's not like you're alone in your, in your garage or you're alone at the gym or alone at the playground. You have been there. You've heard the noises. You've seen the, the looks. <laughs> you are good to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, make sure you go check out that video, Make and Practice Missing Games. But we hope that that's going to kind of help clear up some, some issues with people that keep asking, you know, why am I going out there in my games and just hitting bricks? And yeah. then in practice, I'm just, you know, Steph Curry. Right. Another sidestep on that is this, is that sometimes... Uh, we're not very effective in games because maybe we have developed some little um, mechanical glitch that's keeping us from shooting the ball very well or something like that or dribbling the ball. Uh, and so it's important for you to take and figure out how I can deal with that. So we recommend that, that you do something like this if you're having some kind of a shooting problem that is limiting what you can do uh, is video yourself have somebody else video, then go over and just really check out what you're seeing there. And that may give you a clue as to what's going on or ask the coach, what coach, what do you see? Uh, and uh, oftentimes they will have a little insight into helping you figure out what it is that's keeping you from being more successful. But that's one of the things that happens is that when the speed of execution has to elevate in a game and you haven't been there before, that's when mechanical problems begin to break down. Yeah, and just to close it off too, uh, a lot of people ask, you know, how do I how do I do that game speed, game intensity thing yeah. if I don't have anybody to help me or work right. with me? It's like you can find people. Uh, you know, you could get your mom, or your dad, or your yeah. brother, your sister, or you could have a group of buddies that you get together with and you work on it. Um, you can do the visualization all by yourself and do some spin shooting uh, drills. Uh, there's there's so many ways to make it happen, but you have to kind of be the one that's that's the self starter. Yeah. Um, 
So anyways, that's kind of what we're gonna wrap up on, making practice, missing games. Go check out that video. And right now we're gonna get back into answering your guys' questions and stuff in the chat. So send your questions over, go tell your friends and family, make sure you're following <laughs> us on all the, the fun social site stuff. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we're gonna get into the Q&A. There's a lot of people saying, hey, what's up? Miguel is saying, hey, what's up? Um, a few other people are saying, hey, uh, Wells, Isbell, um yeah so thank you guys for being here yeah but uh let's jump into some questions um let's see this one is from ma rhino who is saying how to develop ball handling you know uh, that's a question <clears throat> that we get an awful lot and one of the, there's there's a couple of of um, uh, skills in basketball that really aren't hammered out very well for players and players therefore don't spend a whole lot of time on them either <clears throat> One of those is ball handling skills. Well, how do you improve ball handling skills? You get, you get a set of uh, drills that you can use, and then when you've got those drills kind of uh, in line, then use them, and use them every day. Use them with both hands. Uh, people are often saying, well, can you give me some special tips for working on my, my weak hand? Yeah, use it. And, and that's the biggest problem that most people have is when they go out, they only work on their strong hand because that's the only one they feel confident with. However, you get into a game situation and you have a player who gets on that right hand and he won't let you go that way or get be functional there and you have to go play with your off hand, then you have to be able to do that. And, and so you do that by spending time on a series of different kinds of drills. And, you know, one of the things that I want to be kind of upfront about, too, is I, I see some vil, uh, uh, drills, and I think they've got a little merit, but I don't particularly spend any time on them because I don't think they really are relative to the game itself. And that is, uh, you know, catching a, 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 a tennis ball while you're dribbling another ball. That never would happen in basketball. They're trying to work on your reflexes probably. But what I want to do is I want to work on the meat and potatoes of what you're going to be facing when you're in a basketball game. You've got to get that guy with a quick cross. You've got to be able to flat back him and, back him and go hard to your left or to your right. And the only way you develop those skills is spend time on them. The surprising thing about it is that most people in the course of a week or, or two weeks can really make an improvement on your ball skills if you get out and spend 20 minutes a day just on this, working on ball skills. And there's there's a hundred different uh, uh, drills that you can use. The things that are, are I think are really important are these. The drills where you have to take and control the basketball and make it do what you want it to do. I often see people who are using the little scissor dribble through the legs and they'll go the other way and they're moving their feet. They're jumping here. Jump. That never occurs in a basketball game. And so, and it's not very efficient in any case. So what you want to do is keep those feet stationary and move the basketball. Make the basketball do what you want it to do. And for me, that's the essence of ball handling. You control the basketball. You make it do what you want to do when you want to do it. And so that's all practice. Yeah, well, I think it's I think it's fine for people to occasionally do things that are maybe not seen in games. Oh, that, I agree. I that, agree. That will help you develop your ball handling. But there are a ton of things that are kind of built around gimmicks and marketing and yes. things like that. So mm -hmm. you know, if you see people that are doing these super elaborate drills with you know you know things that are never seen in basketball, like uh, tennis balls and and playing cards or whatever, you know, I mean that's fine. But I think that we, what you can get in trouble with with that stuff too is that your, your, uh, your focus and kind of the mechanics can fall off in, in an effort to you know, <laughs> integrate these other things yes. in. And what you should really be focusing on is basketball-specific, bas basketball-functional drills. That you're going to use. I mean, yeah. you step out on the basketball court with, with a basketball. I think it's okay to do two-ball dribbling stuff, but uh, you know, to, a, to a point. Um, you have to kind of really get down to exactly what you're going to face in a game. And it's not going to be, um, you know, a bunch of stuff where you're doing your N1 mixtape stuff either. It's like you are going to have to be able to execute a single move and you're going to have to be able to do it. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the other thing is efficiency. And we, t we talk yeah. about this all the time is that you, you don't a coach and, you know, you yourself should not expect you to go there and do three moves and then an execution towards yeah. the, the basket. Yeah. It should be a, a move towards the basket, maybe one move, and then that's it because that's efficient. 
you're cutting out all the opportunity to, to have a mistake, you're cutting out all the variables, and you are getting there efficiently, you're not giving the other defenders that are guarding your teammates time to catch up with what you're doing. Sure, you may have beat that guy with your five moves that you did in, in that stationary spot, but you're not mm -hmm. just dealing with that guy. Yeah. It's, it's you know one on five, mm -hmm. um, so you have to really be efficient. And we don't see that all the time. Right. So answering this very simple question that that person had, <laughs> working or developing your ball handling, you have to work on it every day consistently. Find a few drills that you really like and work with those. In terms of developing your weekend, you have to use it and really get down to just to the effort of putting more time into that. And I would say go check out our videos on ball handling. We have a bunch of ball drills. Uh, ball handling drills, and we have a video on developing your weekend. One parting shot on okay, ball hurry. handling. Hurry. Okay. That ball, that is <laughs> a little tongue-tied there. That particular element that I think is really important, uh, too, really, number one, pound the basketball. So often, uh, players just kind of pet the dog. That's what we call that when they're just real soft dribble. You can't get away with that in a game. And so you want to pound the basketball so it comes to you, back to your hand quickly, and it tends to stick a little better in your fingers when the ball comes up. And the other thing is avoid dribbling the ball too tall because the taller the ball is, the easier it is for the uh, uh, defensive player to time it, step out, and tip it away. So power, dribble. Just okay. really th slam the thing into the floor. Okay, we're going to have to have quicker answers to all this because oh, we have okay. so okay. many questions today. Okay. Um, Cole Whipple is asking how to stand out. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. I would say go check out our videos on how to make the team and we talk about all these ways that make you stand out to coaches yep. that are not about your basketball skills and are not something that you would have to spend months and months and months on developing to stand out. Those are the things that we think will help. And it's going to be things like showing effort, initiative, yeah, big time. leadership. Uh, that is how you truly stand out. Uh, another way to stand out and to stand out negatively is to try to play above your abilities. So you see that all the time with guys that think that they're the next Kobe Bryant or the next Stephen Curry. And they're going out there and they're trying to play at a level at which they do not have the skills to back up. Right. You um, know, there's an el another element I think is really important on that one, too, and that is displaying um, a poor body language. Uh, maybe something happens to you and you have this kind of a little uh, fit on the floor, or maybe you're even on the bench uh, and you have these little fits. Uh, that body language m does make you stand out right, but it's a negative standout. You don't want that. Uh, the thing that I think is really important as a player, what you really want is you want to stand out and you want people to say, hey, hey, look at that guy. Look what he's getting doing. Not, oh, look at that guy. He's being such a bummer right now. And so that's a, your attitude on the floor really can help you stand out or it can make you look really kind of like a, a donkey. Okay, and, and speaking of negative things, and uh, here, here's Jirads who's asking okay. trash talk as a question. Okay. Okay. Um, here's the thing, is that trash talk in basketball is something that is going to be around forever. Um, it's just part of the game, whatever. That's that's just something. My thoughts on it, and I'm sure you probably are, think the same way, is that yep. you are not good enough to back up trash talk. Yeah. Um, trash talk is 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 something that is reserved for the likes of Michael Jordan and Larry Bird. And the thing is, is that trash talk gets you out of your space of of being really dialed in and executing and. If you really want to get into somebody's head, it is not talking about their mom. No. It's not talking about their girlfriend or talking about how bad they are. The way that you get into somebody's head and get under their skin is making them look silly because they are not able to contain you. Yeah. So if you are putting down the points, if you are getting the defensive stops, they are going to be in a much worse place in their mind than they are if you're going to be able to talk them into anything because you've basically taken away what they're trying to do. Yeah. And if you're busy there chatting with them or whatever, you're you're number one, you're taking yourself out of the game and number two, you're letting them into your head too. So yeah. you know, they they're gonna be more comfortable and you're gonna give them incentive to get back at you. And it just it, it never makes any sense. Well uh, on that same ticket, the thing is is that don't listen to them at all. Don't respond to them at all. Yeah, uh, and they're well, that's, trying, that's on the other end of it. Yeah, they're trying to get you to fall into a place where you're not going to be as effective because you're worrying about what they're talking to you about. Just ignore the fact that they're even talking to you. It doesn't make any difference. 
And if you respond, they got gotcha. you. Yeah, they got gotcha. you. And so, if you just if no you, response is the best response. If you want to piss off a guy that is talking trash to you, just no acknowledgement, and that yeah. makes them furious yeah. because they can just talk and talk and talk, and you you make no knowledge or acknowledgement of it. You're putting in the baskets as they're chatting. It's all good. And I would love when guys would play against me and they would want, would want to talk because they would just talk and talk and talk and I, you know, have no no emotion, no response. And if you're just killing them softly with that kind of stuff, it's going to be a long game for them. Yeah. And I mean, that's just our opinion on that stuff. If that's not what you want to believe, that's fine, but I'm just yeah. telling you what has worked in the past yeah. and yeah. Yeah. in general, you are not good enough to ter- talk trash. <laughs> <laughs> let's just leave it at that. And, and okay. that's that's most anybody. Right. Um, let's see. Here's one from Sammy underscore S who says, how do you get out of a shooting slump? Number that, one, yeah, that's, keep shooting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep shooting. And, you know, we mentioned this earlier. One of the things that's really a good idea is to video shelf uh, shooting and then sit down and assess what's going on on that video and see if it is what you need to be doing. A lot of people develop these little uh, snags in their shooting mechanics and they're not even aware of it. We deal with the most, uh, I have two or three that I see most every week. Uh, and that's the basis. Coach, my shot's really off. Okay, let's let's look at it. So we look at it. Oh, okay, here's what I think going on. Oh, okay, that's working. Okay. And so uh, that kind of assessment really can help a lot. And the other is, uh, and you know, uh, have your coach see what he thinks. And uh, that's, that's important to get his eyeball on it, too, and, and his input. But I think Casey's right. I think the biggest thing is keep shooting. Keep shooting. Yeah, and you know, like you said earlier, videotape yourself yep. and see what the problem is. Uh, recognize why you're missing and become your own best coach. Yeah. And you can you can fix pretty much anything. One of the worst things you can do is is start bumming on yourself yeah. and getting harder on yourself as as you are being uh, as you are missing. And the other thing too is this: is that your average mean shooting uh, percentage over time is probably going to even out. More than you think. Yes, sir. Shooting slumps, I mean, the, the only way that you can keep a shooting slump persistent is letting it get to you mentally mm-hmm. or if you have are not addressing some kind of uh, uh, mechanical issue. Yep. Um, but if you're just shooting over time, you might have a bad game where you don't make any any baskets, but then you'll probably have a game where it's, it's kind of off the charts. And yep. after a while, over many games, that'll all even out. That's, that's exactly right, too, because you're not going to shoot perfect every game. You're just not. But, yeah, how to get out of a shooting slump, keep shooting, keep shooting. and not let the mental aspect get you down yeah. and address any mechanical issues. Um, okay, this one is from John Papoop, who says, I'm six foot five. I jump really high and I and can't dunk. People say it's the way I jump wrong. Is it possible? Well, mm-hmm. okay. The thing about dunking is people think that there's some kind of magical trick at the end of it where you where you suddenly uh, flick a switch and you can dunk. Yeah. The issue is if you can get the ball over the top of the rim with your hand on it, you can dunk. And right. if you're not getting high enough to be able to do that, then you should never do it. Yeah. Um, it it's it, There is no magical trick to it. There are some things that you can do to have a better movement pattern as you go up into your jumping. Um you know, we I think we talk about it a little bit in our vertical jump videos and stuff, but maybe that's something that we can talk about in a future video on how to uh, have a good approach in terms of your jumping. But maybe maybe even look at our, our video on the layup, like layups 101. Yeah. And we talk about slowing everything down and working on the lay and run up drill. And that kind of gives you kind of the, the footwork needed to go up and, and, and do a layup, which... A dunk is essentially a layup where if you get your your hand high enough over the rim with the ball in your hand, it's a dunk. Yeah. But there is no magic to dunking the basketball. No. People think that there is. They think that if they could palm it or if they could do this or that, there's plenty of guys that can dunk a basketball and they cannot palm it. Well, and, and the key is jumping high enough to be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, on top of that, you say I jump really high. Uh, well, how high is that? You know? Um, if you're six foot five and you can get off the floor 24 to 28 inches, you ought to be able to dunk it pretty easy. Maybe you're not as as, uh, as good a jumper as you think. So well, that may be a limited too. And sometimes it has to do with the delivery of the ball right at the end. Sometimes we go up and we take and tend the, the ball go across the basket and it'll hit the offside of the rim and come out. Okay, 
That's so. like getting too technical on something yeah. that is not that technical. Yep. Um, you know, a lot of people think that they can dunk simply because they can touch the rim. Yeah. You have to get your hand clearance over the rim yeah. with the ball. Um, okay, whatever. That's that's uh, that's something we can talk about later. But um, let's see. Luis Diaz is asking how to avoid getting nervous and messing up in games. Please help. Get experience. You have to play more. Uh, that's the third pillar of practice where you have to really kind of uh, build up your, your skill levels to the point where when you step out on the floor, you know your skills are going to be there, and so you have confidence in your skills. You know, the other thing I think everybody probably experiences that plays the game is that the first two or three minutes of the game, you're really kind of nervous, and that's anybody. Uh, that's everybody probably uh, a little nervous, some a little more than others and some less. But the fact is, after two or three minutes of getting up and down the floor, usually that nervousness begins to pass, and you get your head into the game, and so it's not something I really worry about very much. Okay, Daniel Mukazi is asking, how can I become great on moving without the ball? Oh, wow, well, what a great question that is. That's good. I love that one. Well, we have a handful of videos that we th will, we think will help you do that. Um, part of it, though, is having the mentality that you're not going to just stand there without anything to do and mm -hmm. think that you're going to be a part of the game and you're going to have the, the right to have the basketball in your hands. You have to do work to get open. You have to do work to create space. So that's kind of the first step is, is realizing that you have – a job to do even if you don't have the ball yep um, and the things that you can do when you don't have the ball and we have videos on I think most of the stuff is uh, doing an L cut doing a V cut doing a back door cut uh, setting a screen on ball screen flashing the ball off ball screen flashing down screens cross screens you know the whole idea of moving without the ball is is something that every player needs to know in the course of a basketball game, let's say a 32-minute uh, high school basketball game, probably you as a player, unless you're a point guard, are going to have the ball in your control about two to two and a half minutes over the whole course of that game. What do you do the rest of the game? Well, the rest of the game you have to be affecting some things that's going to give your team a better chance to, to win the game. Doing the things that we just talked about. Casey's talking about uh, um, the V-cut, L-cut, uh, uh, back cut, uh, screening on ball, screening off ball, cross screening, down screening, all of those things are really important. One of the things that really bums me out as, as a coach, and I harp on it a lot, is that I don't want to ever see you pass the ball to somebody and stand there and wait for it to come back. The reason that I don't like that is, number one, you are standing still and your defender is helping defend the person who has the basketball. If you take and move then that defender's got to move with you. And let's say you take him to the far corner, then he's out of the picture, and he can't help double-team that guy, that other player with the basketball. So or you're moving <coughs> is really important. Or you're diving down the lane, or you're running to the corner, and exactly. the, the, your teammate is rotating up, whatever it is. Screaming opposite. There's a ton of things you can do, and you need to learn how to play that way. Yeah, and I mean, it's one of those things that you're not just running around like a crazy person, yeah. but you, are, you have purposeful things that you are doing. You're trying to set up opportunities for you and your teammates um, and you, you know the thing is is that don't be the guy that is just standing there like a totem pole it is you know you have to earn the right to get the basketball yep and just because you're wide open standing there doesn't mean that you have the best opportunity and you should get the ball right you should be moving it without it um, okay here's one from Robert Stark who says is it important to get basket I guess basketball gear like sleeves and goggles mm -hmm. okay Here's the thing. None of that stuff is is going to affect or make you a better player. Uh, unless it's something where, like, in terms of goggles, if you need something that's going to improve your eyesight, that's that's definitely a way to go, like goggles or, or glasses or contact lenses. If that's going to help you with your vision, that is a different scenario. If we're talking about stuff that is mostly a style, style choice, uh, like these sleeves and and whatever they may be leg legs leg sleeves or certain socks whatever that's just gear maybe it makes you feel more comfortable in your shoes or whatever it is that's fine but mostly it is just kind of a gimmicky thing that you know people do for a stylistic choice right. there is a small amount of of truth in the fact that it might help keep your joints and muscles warm or something like that um, if you're in colder weather, obviously you need to protect yourself against that kind of thing. 
Um, if you're prone to diving on the floor, maybe having those those pads or something mm -hmm. like that might be a good thing. But you know, they they market that stuff so that you guys buy it and make you think that you need it, but you don't really need it. You can yeah. play with just your your uniform and your shoes, yeah. and you will be good to go. Yeah. Uh, that stuff does not make you a better player because if it did, everybody would wear that stuff. Um, and mostly it is just a marketing thing. But if you want to get that and it's not going to break your bank, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, Personal and it, choice. And it comes down to the same thing with shoes, too. Find the shoes that are comfortable for you. They feel good on your feet. And that's not always going to be the $300 LeBrons. Yeah. That might be the, the $65 fill in the blankers. You know, um, you just have to find what works best for you. And just because it costs three hundred dollars doesn't make it a better shoe. And the other thing is too is that uh, you know we we know and, and Chase, who is who's one of the other shot science guys, he has actually done studies on the fact that after about two or three months of actually playing basketball in consistently practice. in practice, your shoes break down, and you should probably buy new ones in that time period. So if you are buying $300 shoes every three months, that's going to really, or every two months, that's going to really start to add up. Right. So, uh, you know, keep that in consideration. Um, let's see. And nothing, no piece of gear is going to make you the, the next best player. No, no, no. This never happens. Um, let's see. This one is from Johnny Ray who says, how do you make clutch shots with defenders on you? Okay, well, if, when I see something like that, especially when there's an S on the end of defenders, I start to wonder, is that even a good shot for you to take? Yeah, true. Um, you have to really look at shot selection and think, is this a good shot? Am I open? What, are, what is my shooting percentage going to be if I, if I shoot this? And does uh, somebody else have a better shot than I do? Yeah, you I mean, if, you, if you've got defenders, plural, on you, then that means that somebody else is probably wide open. Exactly. Um, and if you're talking about just being clutch... I mean, that, being clutch is, is, is doing all the things that we've talked about, and that's developing your skills and dialing it all in, doing the game speed, game intensity practice, and then doing the game experience so that you build your skills up to the point where they are there for you when you need them. Yep. Um, a lot of times, people that are not clutch and choke <laughs> are people that have not put in the work. They, they haven't accounted for all the variables of playing basketball. They aren't able to execute when the pressure is on. But if you have put in the work to, to kind of be in that space, then you'll be, you'll be fine. Right. Right? Um, okay, let's find some. A lot of people are asking about different players and their layups. Uh, somebody's asking about Kyrie Irving's layups and, and, and Stephen Curry's layups. Here's the thing. You should not be trying to emulate anybody in the style that you play basketball or the way that you execute basketball. What you should do is you should have an approach where you are developing from the fundamentals up because you don't have the body plans or the, 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 the body mechanics of any of those guys because you're a different person and they're the same thing. They wouldn't try to, to emulate so-and-so because they have a different body type and everything right. too. So if you build up from the fundamentals, you will be able to evolve to what is best for you. And you know, those guys, I can guarantee you that Stephen Curry and Kyrie Irving, they, when they were growing up, they were a part of about a million layup lines, just like everybody else. <laughs> and they did all the work to put in the fundamentals. And eventually over time, they may, may have developed their own style or whatever. And that's great. But you need to be you, you need, because you cannot be those other people. Right? That's, that's really the truth. And, and so oftentimes we kind of get hung up in that wanting to be like Mike. In reality, we aren't like Mike, and uh, most of us aren't anyway. And the thing is, is that you need to develop a skill like layups or whatever that really works for you in the game of basketball. And everybody's a little bit different. Some people shoot the ball with an overhand stroke. Some people shoot it with an underhand stroke. Layups. Uh, we're talking about layups, yeah. And so um, you, what you need to do is find out, okay, what works for me? Not necessarily that I want to look like Kyrie Irving or somebody else. I, I mean, here's the thing is that, sure, okay, you want to look like that guy doing that thing. Yeah. But the real key of basketball is putting the ball in the basket. Exactly. What is going to be the most effective way to do that? Because there's one thing that Kyrie Irving does, and that is he puts the ball in the basket. Yep. So uh, is that the best approach for you to – 
emulate this person um, or would you rather have the results of that person? Yeah. Um, I think that you probably want the results. And the same thing is true with shooting or playing defense or blocking shots or whatever, whatever it may be. You have to build up for you from the ground up. And, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, well, I want to shoot like uh, Kevin Durant or I want to shoot like so-and-so. Uh, I want to play in the post like so-and-so. Here's the thing is that in reality, most of us are not six foot 11 with seven foot five inch wingspans. Um, if you think about the proportions of a lot of these guys, and, and on top of that, super athletic where they jump 36 to 40 inches in the air right. and, and all these crazy things, you know, you probably are not that body type and you're probably not that uh, athletic type. Um, but you, maybe you can jump that high, but you probably don't have that body, or maybe you have a body kind of close to those proportions, which is which is crazy and freakish as it is in, in normal life. But maybe you don't have that athleticism. A lot of these NBA guys are combinations of these incredible bodies and athleticisms, yeah. and for you to try to emulate those those guys, it's not going to end up where you think it is. Yeah. You need to really build for your body type because you probably don't have. Uh, the proportions where your wingspan is eight or nine inches what your uh, what your height is. Uh, you just really have to be conscious of the fact that you are your own body. Most of us are normal body types, and that's fine. You can still be a very successful basketball player, but you should really build for you, not for Kevin Durant's body. Yeah, truly. Um, just a kind of a rant because we see that all the time. Everybody's asking, how do I shoot like so-and-so? How, how do I, and it's like, you, you can't, you cannot, you are not six foot 11 <laughs> with arms so long that you reach up, you know, nine and a half feet. It, it's just crazy. Um, let's see. Rocky Hatch is asking, practicing free throws is important at any, oh, he's talking to somebody else. Uh, Robert Stark is asking at middle school level, how important is practicing free throws? He says three throws, but uh, it's, it's free throws. Um, it's important at every level. It is. It's those are free shots. In basketball, you don't get any sh free anything except for free throws. Yeah. So take take the time and during your practice routine, uh, while you're working yourself out, you're doing the three pillars of practice. You should be working in free throws at different points throughout your workout, so that your conditioning is going to be there for your free throws as well as everything else. Because if you go out there and you just shoot free throws at the beginning of practice, and then you expect that when you're in the deep fourth quarter of a game that your free throw abilities are going to be there, they are not because you have not worked at that fatigue level. Right. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Manuel Pellessier is asking, do you think sleeved jerseys affect players? I mean, I think that it's, again, it's a marketing thing. Uh, it probably is more of a, a mental thing for people. I think people are mostly used to just the regular cut off jerseys mm -hmm. and stuff, but you know, people have played with shirts and undershirts and everything for, for, you know, decades, decades. Yeah. and it, it doesn't really affect it. I think that I, I'm not a fan really of those things, but I don't think it affects people the way that, that people think it does. It's not a positive effect. Anyway. I, I mean, unless it's like super tight and it's limiting your, your movement, yeah. that's a problem. Well, then you could be like LeBron and rip it off and the crowd would roar. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tubby Nation is saying, what is the best basketball shoe for players? That's a good it, question. It's a really, it's an individual uh, kind of choice. I Absolutely. mean, you have to put on the shoes and see if they are they fit and are comfortable. Maybe you've done a little bit of research and seen um, how they hold up. Um, you know, you maybe put them through a few paces in terms of uh, seeing if they have the grip and all that that you want. But you know the thing. One thing that Chase went through and he saw in his studies is that it doesn't matter if you're buying the three hundred dollar shoe or the sixty five dollar shoe. They all break down at least at around the same uh, rates. Yep. Um, and the three hundred dollar shoes, they might have a ton of marketing and and uh, you know so called science behind them and everything. But most most shoes, if you're getting them from kind of um, reputable people. reputable mm -hmm. companies and stuff they're all going to be about the same yeah you know the one element that I would would think about is this is a shoe that is comfortable for you to wear while you're playing basketball I mean that's way more important yeah. than anything else just is it comfortable does it fit well is it comfortable uh, is it stable 
uh, some shoes are made um, where they're sometimes they, the uh, uh, soles will kind of roll a little bit. That's not a real stable shoe. So those things, stability and comfort, I think, are way more important than anything else. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing is that your gear should not have any effect on you during your game. You yeah. should not think about any of that stuff. Yeah. Your shoes should just be there and they should work. If you are sitting there concerned about your shoes or your shoes are hurting you or you're not, uh, they're, they're, they're too narrow or they're not comfortable or they're too small, whatever it is, that's, that's something that's going to affect your game. But if you are putting on your shoes and you don't feel or you don't think about them the whole game, that is the kind of shoe that you want to have on. Yeah. Uh, you know, the shoes are not going to make you jump higher. They're not going to make you faster. And they're not going to make you a better basketball player. Sure. But they can affect you negatively if you don't feel good in them. So exactly. that's that's the only way that they could really limit you. Um, so there is no here get this basketball shoe because everybody's going to be different. You know, another thought that kind of comes into my mind, when you get further into that season – and you're feeling that shoe is beginning to get a breakdown, and you can tell when it's starting to break down, um, uh, then it maybe it's time for you to change shoes, get another pair, because that's a situation there where you could injure yourself with a, a roll of the ankle or, or something like that. So, Or it's going to hurt your arches and things yeah, like that. Yeah. Okay, anyways, moving on. Um, let's have some, uh, let's let's just say lightning round, because, All right. All because right. we need to have shorter answers to some of these <laughs> questions to get through them. Um, okay, this one is from Kivani Emil, who says, how to know if you have good arc on your shot? Oh, that's a great question. Well, um, uh, number one is, is are you missing your shots? And yeah. number two is, how are you missing your shots? Yeah. Um, number three is, if you're making your shots consistently, you're probably on the right track. Well, that's probably true. But one of the things I think is really important when you're practicing your shooting is to take a moment or two every once in a while and just check the arc of the basketball on its way to the basket. In, in our opinion, probably the arc of the, basket, uh, the basketball on like a three-point shot needs to be somewhere between 13 and 15 feet at the highest point of the arc. Uh, that's going to give you the best attack on the basket. And so uh, check it out. You know, Three-point or three free throw? Uh, well, free, a three free throw wants to be about the same thing, yeah, uh, because that's when we get the largest basket there is when we have that nice arc. Well, here's the thing is that it is, it is going to be subjective to each person, and you really have to evaluate yourself and, like we said, videotape yourself and kind of be actively involved in looking at your shooting mechanics. Yeah, just take a um, look at it, yeah. And the thing is is that if you are missing shots and you're missing them because they're hitting off the front rim, they're hitting off the back rim and, and launching out. They're hitting off the right or left. Uh, you know, those are those are issues with your shooting. If your shot is too short and hitting off the front rim, that probably means your shot is too flat. Exactly. If you're shooting it and it's making it over the rim, but it's hitting the back rim and, and bounding back out uh, with kind of a, a very acute uh, angle, then that means that, that, that it's probably flat as well. Exactly. If you are shooting it and your misses are hitting the rim and they're kind of bouncing and sticking around the rim, that's probably a good height. That's a great indicator there to tell you whether you've got enough arc. But if you have too much arc, and that's something that's a little bit harder to, to decipher yeah. because you probably will hit a few, you probably will miss a few, and they might look a little bit like uh, a good shot arc would look. Yeah. But if you are putting too much arc on it, then you are technically shooting a longer shot. Yeah, and, and, and oftentimes they're short of the basket when they've got too much arc, too. Wow, uh, horrible lightning round here. Okay, okay hang on. Let me fit one more comment. One of the things that creates, uh, well, two things that create a flat arc when you shoot. One is if the elbow is out too far. The other is that if you do not elevate the elbow on your shot. When you do those two things here, elevate your elbow and keep the elbow in, you're probably going to shoot the ball with a better arc. Those are important points for your member. All right, Karen Bray is saying, "Hey, Coach, how do I? How do I? Uh, I it says I recently got. Uh, okay, the wording is a little goofy here. Hold on. Uh, hey, Coach, I recently got moved up from freshman to varsity basketball. How do I get used to the pace and harder competition slash practices? You just got to do it. You just get into it and compete and try to keep up. You know, what happens is that after a few days, you begin to get used to the higher intensity of, of, of a varsity practice. And so that's just something that you 
you'll find that you will work your way into. It might take you a week, maybe even two weeks, but in order for you to keep up, and you'll want to keep up because you don't want to be a lagger, you don't want to look bad, so you start to play with more intensity, and, and you'll, you'll be fine with that. It goes back to, again, uh, putting in effort, initiative, yeah. Uh, and, and doing all those things that we tell you to do in the How to Make the Team video that will help you get to that point. You might not be there right away, but don't get down on yourself. Don't let it affect what you're doing. Just keep pushing and you will be fine. Yeah. Um, okay, this one is from Robert Stark. He says, do you see BBL, British Ball League, is a good alternative to the NBA for British players? Uh, we don't know much about British basketball, mm. um, I don't think that there's there's not too many guys in the NBA that are from from um, uh, from England or any of the British Isles or anything, right? I don't I don't know of any. Yeah. Um, but I mean, here's the thing: <laughs> if you are an NBA caliber player, chances are you will find yourself in the NBA or a very uh, you know kind of a, a a league similar to that somewhere else in the world. And I think somebody else down here, it might have even been Robert, he's asking about um, what what's better for a British high school player going to college or looking for a hood team so scouts can see you. Well, here's the thing, is that <laughs> scouts probably they know about you. you if you are there. They will find um, you. And mm -hmm. if they don't, then you probably need to do the groundwork to send around your 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 tape, your, your highlight tape or whatever it is, your, your recruitment tape. Uh, or not tape anymore. It's it's going to be like a video that you put together and upload to YouTube, and maybe you're emailing it around to different coaches and trying to get some interest that way. Um, most of the scouts are going to be at these tournaments that are put together for traveling teams and, and AAU teams. Have no idea how that goes in England or any of the British Isles or anything like that. But uh, you know, I'm sure that it's fairly similar. Um, and if you go back to some of our older live shows, we have a few coaches that talk about that kind of stuff and how international players kind of can get noticed. Yeah. Um, so go look at some of our older videos with some of the coaches that we, we did, um, and that might help. Yeah, that probably would help, yeah. I'm not sure what a hood team is. i um, thinking that maybe that's like a traveling team of some kind. But yeah, uh, the thing is, is that you if you were in high school, and that's what you are there, uh, okay, um, you might want to be in that that kind of a, a team format, maybe a travel team. Over here, they're called AU teams or travel teams. Uh, until you're out of high school, and then it's time for you to go into college then and play at that level. Very few people ever come out of just high school and play in the NBA. I don't know what the numbers are, but it's, it's very few, very few. It's very few that come from college and well, go into the NBA. The, the NBA. the NBA, yeah. The NBA is such a small group of people yep. that you know it, it's it's almost it's great to have that as a dream and an ultimate kind of goal. But you need to hit these progressive stepping stones, right. and if you eventually get to the point where that's something that is a realistic goal, then that's that's great. But you need to get there in a certain specific way. Yeah. Um, there's very few people that just jump right into it and, get, and make it that way. And they're usually absolute freaks of nature mm -hmm. uh, in terms of their body type and their athleticism and their skill level. Um, not too many people are like that. And, and even people that, that are part of, okay, this is crazy, but even people that are famous uh, NCAA players that make it all the way through and they win the national championship game. They're the, you know, the, the, the MVP of, of the game or whatever. They don't necessarily even go on to the NBA. Yeah, that's true. Uh, a lot of those guys end up overseas or they end up in the D league or they end up coaching or they end up not playing basketball anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just because you reach a certain level does not mean that you will move on. Just because you are a successful basketball player does not mean that you're getting a ticket right in the NBA. Uh, it's it's it, to be realistic, it is a very select group of people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Via who is asking you, who do you think will beat the Warriors ending their win streak? Nobody. They're gonna go all the way. Yeah. No, we're Warriors fans. We're not gonna talk about how they're gonna lose. <laughs> um, let's see. And we're from the Bay Area. All the people that are always saying, "Oh, you know, Warrior fan, uh, wa uh, fan wagon, bandwagon," not here. Um, <laughs> let's see. This one is from Tyrese Mahekeya, who says, uh, "How can I set a hard screen 
without getting a hip check or called for a foul. Hmm. Got to be straight up and down. Got to yep. be set and established. And you can't give extra bumps or lean in on that stuff. Yeah, that's really the truth of it. And, you know, usually those hip bumps uh, that you get called for is because your feet are spread too wide. Uh, typically, officials allow you to get shoulder width on his feet and maybe a little bit more, but you'll see a, a lot of guys who are really spread out, and that's when the other player gets into your hip trying to get around you, and that's probably when they'll call you on that too. So don't let your feet get so wide. The other thing that's really important too on that is that your offensive player uh, or uh, your defensive player – hang on, I lost my trot. Okay, so I'm going to let it go because I can't remember what it was. All right, let's well, the next one. Yeah, I, I was uh, looking at some questions here, but okay. uh, let's see. Uh, Asher Rizwan is asking, during shoot around, I can shoot very well. However, when I'm in a game, I cannot make a single shot. How can I fix this? If you go back and watch this video, we talked about that at the at the very beginning. Yeah. And we also have a video called Make and Practice Missing Games that is a separate video that we put together that we think will help you. Yeah. Um, so go check that out. Um delusional kid is asking what workouts can i do in the gym to get hops do squats work uh and, the, and other people are asking too about developing their vertical here's the thing go look at our vertical jump video series and we talk about all the things that you need to be conscious of when you're developing your your vertical and that what you're working on in terms of just general conditioning and athleticism or whatever so go check out that video or those videos and then get the vertical jump handbook and you will be in a good place uh, just going out and doing squats is not a, a way to specifically address all the different <laughs> elements of your uh, athleticism. And, and your vertical is not just power. Yeah, it's not just true. strength. There is, there's many things that go into it. Just doing squats, I mean, that's, that's not going to – it doesn't translate directly to the functionality of basketball. Right. Um, it might be part of it, but that's not the, the one way to do it. Um, Hector Tavares is asking, how do I stop getting nervous with the ball? You have to get game experience. You have to get your skills up to the level where you know that they're going to be there for you and you're going to have confidence that they're going to be there. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, Jalen Thorpe is saying, I'm a six foot two small forward at my high school. I have very bad flat feet and I can't get as much explosion as I want. How do I get the explosion that I want? Well, <laughs> If you have flat feet and something like that is, t I guess, technically a medical condition, you probably should go and talk to a doctor or somebody that can help you with that. Uh, I know Chase had flat feet and like had a lot of problem with his arches and stuff, and he started using orthotics and things that would help him with that. Um, in terms of your explosion, there's tons of things that you can do, and yeah. I would send you back to the Vertical Jump Handbook to yeah. check that stuff out. Yeah, the Vertical ha Jump Handbook and, and just the jumping in general – it really helps you develop your explosion. That's really important too, not only for uh, jumping, but uh, okay, so there's what's better. Uh, Fisica Ciencia is saying, what is better, explosiveness or resistance? And you've said it like about 12 times. Um, I, I don't know why that would be a comparison. Um, mm -hmm. resi are you talking about in terms of training? Uh, I mean, if you're working on developing your explosiveness, then resistance is going to be part of that yeah. training. Yeah. Um, but when you're talking about developing as some kind of athletic, uh, you know, uh, attribute, resistance is not an attribute. Resistance is yeah. kind of a, a methodology of training. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you want to be explosive. So I, I'm not really sure what you're asking there. Um, let's see here. Somebody was asking about... Uh, Jer Jeremy Mejia is asking how to become a smart team player, a smarter team mm. player. Mm. Well, you have to, number one, get the game experience and kind of know what the heck is going on. Yeah. Um, and number two, I think it really helps to develop your abilities to move without the ball and create opportunities for your teammates. Um, learn how to set a screen. Um, but generally, just being able to move without the ball is a huge deal, I think. Um, Obviously, most people that play basketball know what to do when they get the ball in their hands, but yeah. what do they do when they don't have it in their hands? Very, very important question, too. You know, one of the things I think that becoming a smarter player is as you are in, involved in a game that is either coming up or, or, or something like that, coaches talk about different elements of the, the game of the other team. 
be up to speed on that. All right, here's 42. He doesn't go to his right at all. All he does is go left. Okay, with that information, you can play smarter because you can get up on that left hand, force him to play with his right hand, and that probably is going to have an effect on his play during the course of the game. So that's an element of being smarter. Is this guy over here, does he go hard for the backboard uh, when there's a shot up? No, he's lazy. He doesn't follow through. So you don't really need to spend too much time thinking about going out there and blocking him off uh, uh, on a rebound. So those are the things that maybe can uh, help you in being a smarter uh, a smarter player. And also developing your court vision and things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really just being aware and creating those opportunities. That's and, really the truth. I think awareness is a good word for that, Casey. Um, okay, here's one from Panda Yo who says, when do you slow down in games? I don't know when to do it, and after four minutes of the game, I'm tired. <laughs> there is no point, really, that you ever slow down. Uh, I mean, when, when you know, maybe the, the whistle blows and the play stops, then you maybe uh, can take a break. But yeah. there's no point where there's a, a set to kind of slow down at any time no. if you're if you're getting tired that's a conditioning issue and so you need to work on developing your conditioning that's really true um dylan solorio is asking how do i improve my b-ball iq game experience you know that's really the truth of it and being aware of what's going on i know that we have players who play and they're not really they're not really in the know about what's going on in the game. They just know what they're doing and what the other person's doing, and they, they're not into the flow, and that's where that IQ comes in. You're understanding that, okay, if this guy uh, cuts to the baseline, then this guy's going to cut to the ball, and I want to be able to cut that off. Those are, those are IQ things, and there's thousands of those in the game of basketball that you learn over time. Okay, J. Dad Neves is saying, I've got a game on Sunday. Any advice? Today is Sunday, isn't Win it? Win that game. Uh, the advice would be to play at your ability, yeah. show effort, initiative, leadership, and move without the ball. Uh, yeah. If that's something that's not part of your game, uh, we'd love to see you uh, maybe add that in. Yeah. Create some new opportunities. Um, let's see here. We're going to take maybe two more questions, and then we're going to get out of here. Um, okay. Hersh, Hersh, uh, Hisham Masha says, I have tryouts soon. What should I do to prepare? Okay, first, we have multiple videos on that. So go check out our videos on how to make the team. And then I think we talked about that a week or so ago on our live show. And we give you a ton of tips on what to do. But in terms of preparing for your tryouts, you can't, you can't jam six months of, of training into a week. No, um, no, no, no. So in terms of developing your skills, that's going to be a, not something that you can rush. Hopefully, you've been working on that for a while. But you can do things like show initiative, show effort, and leadership skills, um, have a good attitude. Those are all things that stand out to coaches above all these you know, skill evaluations that yeah. they're doing. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of what we would say. But go check out those videos, and good luck. Um, let's take one more question here. Um, let's see. This one is from... Hesham? Hesham, Masha, again, who says, how do you make a teammate pass the ball? Hmm. Okay. Uh, I think we've talked about this before in, in, yeah. in our video on t yeah. how to deal with a ball hog. But, I think we talked about it last week quite a bit. But here's the thing. You do not instantly have the right to have the basketball. Even if you're standing wide open on the three-point line, you don't necessarily have the right to have it because there might be – uh, a better opportunity for, for a teammate or, or something or whatever. And just passing you the ball is a risk. So you need to do something that is going to make it uh, undeniable that you should have the basketball. So and, you, yeah, There's another word for that, and that is you have to make sure your teammates trust you with the basketball. That's key. Well, I mean, that's part of it. If they trust, don't trust you... They will play around you. Well, that trust is one part of it too. But I, I'm thinking more like make it undeniable in the fact that you have done the V cut. Yep. You have done the L cut. You've done the back door cut. You're posting up. Uh, you're flashing in the post. You're setting screens. You're doing all these things that make it uh, undeniable that you deserve the ball. Yep. If you're just standing out there waving your hands back and forth, not really, nope. not really showing much nope, effort. Nope, nope, nope. Um, okay. So I think that's going to do it for us today, you guys. Thanks for being here. 
Uh, if we didn't get to your, your question, it's not because we don't like you, it's because we just ran out of time. And, and if you want your question answered during the week, you can just send us a, you know, a message on Twitter or mm -hmm. on Facebook or something like that. Uh, we are shot science everywhere and we do our best to try to get back to you guys. And if you find a video of ours that kind of relates to your question, that's the best way for us to get back to you in yeah. terms of answering that question. Yeah. So make sure you do that. Um, I, I've seen some stuff going on in the chat. Make sure you're getting your information from people that uh, that you have evaluated and you trust. Yeah, sure. um, there's a lot of people with opinions out there, and if as long as they are backing it up with something logical that makes sense to you, that's good. Be uh, cautious. Um, okay, so we will see you guys next week, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Follow us on all of our social media stuff: uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook. Google Plus, uh, we're on Snapchat. You fill in the blank. We will be there as Shot Science. All right? Okay, we'll see you guys next time. Thank Thanks. you all. See you next week. Bye. Okay, I got to figure out how to turn it off. There we go.